All right. All right. Welcome, everybody. It's day four of the Natural Resource Management Academy, a virtual edition during coronavirus time. So I'm Lauren Traster. I'm the 4-H Teen and Leadership Program Coordinator for UVM Extension. And with me today is my partner in collaboration, Hannah Phelps, who's with the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department. We do this program together. So I am going to share my screen. For those of you who have been with us all week, um, we are going to start out like we've been doing. Um, find your chat box and tell us your name, where you're from. Today's question to answer. If there is a big puddle on the road, oh, my picture. It actually says, do you go around it or walk through it and make a big splash? I'm sorry, my graphic got in the way there. So name where you're from. Do you walk around a puddle or are you the kind of person that goes right through it to make a big splash? Brennis is definitely a big splash. So does Sage. Hannah walks around it. So does KL. And oh my God, it's coming in fast and furious. Jack goes around it. A lot of, a lot of you go around it. I think I go around, I would probably, well, I, you know, I think it depends what shoes I have on. <laughs> I think that's the deciding factor for me is what shoes I have on. So welcome Tovin and Olivia and Garrett. I see Paige is with us and Jacob's here today. Ella and Noah are back again. This is great. We are so happy you're all joining us. I can recognize many of you have been here all week, which is just fantastic. And if today's your first day with us, then welcome. We're so happy that you are gonna spend some time with us today. So just as a reminder, and you guys can keep um, putting your responses in the chat, I'm gonna have Hannah right now pop into the chat box. If you need closed captioning, um, we're gonna put in a link for you to click on, which will give you our live streaming for the closed caption. Um, so that's just been put into the chat box. I do wanna remind everyone, to go click on your name in the participant list, you're gonna have an option to rename yourself. It's, um, we would like to know your first and last name because for those of you who are trying to get the NERMA certificate at the end of the week, we actually need to have an accurate participant list to know who is with us. You can also put your first name and just your last initial. Um, and if you're uncomfortable with that, you also can just private chat me and just let me know if your name does not match what would be on the registration list. Um, most of you have been doing great with this and we do have good registration lists from all three days so far, but it's also just really fun for us to know who's here. Um, so go ahead and make sure you do that. Um, just reminding you all that we are recording today, so it's up to you whether you want to have your video on or off, that is your choice. Um, but we are recording because I know some people can't make every day and are, are, are looking forward to watching the sessions at a later date. So our protocols for gathering in what I like to call Zoom land. So we ask that you stay muted unless you um, want to respond to a question where you would raise your hand and we'll call on you where you, then you can unmute yourself. Um, we also use the chat box quite regularly to answer questions, um, have responses, and um, you know we just want to make sure the chat box is used appropriately. So we're going to just be courteous and respectful today that the chat box is being used um, just for the program um, and staying on topic. If you do have your video on, please remember, um, don't create any distractions, which means, you know, don't be making silly faces, make sure there's nothing happening in your background that would be distracting, um, which also means if you're on an iPhone or an iPad or, or some device that's movable, try to stay in one spot so that doesn't become a distraction of you moving around your house or wherever you are. Um, again, you know, go and rename yourself so that we know who's here. And you all have been so great the last several days um, participating and engaging. And so we're gonna ask that you just continue that because it's way more fun if all of you participate 
um, when our presenters ask questions or when we do our icebreakers. It just makes for a fun time together. So I do want to remind you of some upcoming programs. I spoke about these yesterday. Next week, we are going to just resume our teen science cafes with a topic on vet science, looking at uh, zoonotic disease and, and um, infectious disease epidemiology as it relates to animals. It's going to be a pretty cool um, topic. We also are going to be hosting a special teen time. If anybody's interested in robotics and might be interested in being a first robotics ambassador, uh, in Vermont, we're trying to create more of these teams. And so there's going to be a discussion on how to get involved in this program and become an ambassador in your school or, or your community. Um, I also mentioned the Youth Environmental Summit yesterday, and I emailed all of you today. We're always looking not just for professionals in environmental organizations to give presentations. We also highly encourage youth presenters to talk about maybe um, things you did at school, actions you've taken, or knowledge that you have that you could share on a topic. So if you think you might want to do a proposal, um, just look at that email I sent um, earlier today, and there's a workshop proposal. Um, it's pretty easy. It's three questions, um, and it's, you can think about it until August 15th, because that is the deadline. So today's icebreaker, we're going to play a game called This or That. And I'm going to unshare my screen. No, we're not. I just need to get to the polls. All right, so we're going to play This or That. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pop a poll question up. And you have to decide this or that. Which one do you prefer? So our first poll, launching This or That, dogs or cats? Are you a dog person or are you a cat person? Oh, good. Dogs are winning. I'm a total dog person. Hannah, what are you? I'm a dog person as well. Awesome. All right. Oh, I have to say, in my small apartment, I've started to really want a cat as well. So. <laughs> I'd love a dog, but don't have the space. <laughs> I'm highly allergic to cats. Mm. All right, so our next this or that, bowling or mini golf? Oh, they are neck and neck. Oh, it is neck and neck. Who's gonna win? Uh, we have mini golf showing up in the chat. Couple of mini golfs. That might have just tied it. Let's call this yeah. one a tie. All right. Your next one. Skiing or snowboarding? Oh, let's see. Oh, this one's taken off. Looks like skiing is in a lead, although a couple other people still need to vote. But I think skiing's gonna win this one. I am a diehard skier, former racer, ski tester. Mm. Love it. My husband, though, is a snowboarder. <laughs> I and grew we up have been able to well. live and coexist <laughs> as a mixed sport couple. <laughs> I do them both. They're both really fun, but I've been skiing for longer, so. Yeah. All right. This or that. Plain M&Ms or peanut M&Ms? Plain M&Ms, hands down for me. And peanut <laughs> M&Ms, hands down for me. I don't know, Hannah. I think we have to, we have to just, we have to stop working together. Oh, man. I just can't overcome this one. <laughs> But this one is pretty much plain M&M is winning by far. All right, so you all are siding with Hannah. I see how that works. <laughs> Those of you who like peanuts, peanut M&Ms, you just come with me. All right, how about Hulu or Netflix? 
Yeah, I don't have Hulu, so I guess Netflix for me on this one. I have Hulu because that's what I started with because it had the shows I wanted to watch. I only watch it. I have a exercise machine. Mm. So, and now I won't switch because I'm just like, how many of you have things and you just keep them because the hassle of discontinuing, <laughs> like canceling yep. a subscription? Oh, why bother? <laughs> All right. Most of you are Netflix. That's what I figured. I am definitely an anomaly with Hulu and six others of you. <laughs> All right, our last one. Are you an early bird or are you a night owl? Mm -hmm. I am clearly an early bird. I am not. <laughs> <laughs> it's a struggle every morning to get out of bed on time. <laughs> oh, I like, uh, Noah says both. Mm. I, so you just don't sleep a lot. I know. So, I, so uh, KL says, I wish I were an early bird. I know a lot of people who say that. I, I actually feel lucky to be an early bird to just get up and go. So it looks like most of you are night owls, which makes sense since most of you are teens. I think it's more of your uh, biorhythms at this point in your life. So that is this or that. Great playing. We've now learned a bunch about each other and uh, we can have support groups for one another after this. <laughs> All right. Hogan says that he's crepuscular. So he's both. I think that's <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. All right. Well, you guys know that we're, the Natural Resource Management Academy is five days this week. Today is Thursday, which means it is day four. So we have one more presentation um, after today. I'm gonna give you a little insight in tomorrow. Hannah has been um, listening very closely to all the presentations this week, and she is coming up with some trivia questions that at the end of tomorrow, we're gonna do a little trivia uh, to see how you all have done. So that's something to look forward to. Um, but today, what we have look, to look forward to is our topic on becoming a citizen scientist using iNaturalist. And Hannah is gonna introduce today's presenter. Awesome, so today we have Emily Anderson with us. Um, she is the Eco-AmeriCorps Citizen Science Outreach Naturalist at the Vermont Center for Eco Studies. She has an educational background in ecology and environmental policy um, and experience working with natural systems from forests to oceans. She's passionate about using communication tools to raise awareness of the impacts that human have, humans have on biodiversity. Um, and she's here with us today to talk about becoming a citizen scientist using iNaturalist. So Emily, welcome. And go ahead and take it away. Yes, Emily, welcome. Great, thank you for having me. So I'm just going to get my screen share up and running here so I can show you my presentation. Great. And hopefully now, in a second, you'll be able to see a full screen slideshow. So I think I think it's up and running now. So it is great. So welcome everyone. Um, as I just said, I'll be talking about um, how to become a citizen scientist using iNaturalist. Um, but before I start talking about that, first we're going to spend a minute or two talking about a spider. Um, and I know it might not be what you want to see this afternoon. Not everyone loves spiders, but um, this isn't just any spider. It's a black palped jumping spider, which is kind of a interesting name for it. Um, and it was found by a wildlife biology student from UVM in Burlington in the summer of 2019. Um, and when he found this spider, he took a picture of it with his phone and he put it, he put it up on iNaturalist where um, scientists and experts commented and he told the, they told them something really interesting about this spider. Does anyone have a guess as to why this spider was so exciting for um, people to see? And you're more than welcome to uh, share that in the chat or raise your hands. Uh, Tovin said it was a new species. Ooh, good guess. And Brenna said it hadn't been seen. Eva, endangered maybe. Um, Lily also says because it might be a new species. 
Yeah, so those are all really great guesses. Um, and you're right in the sense that it was a new species for this area. Um, it hadn't been seen here before, but instead of being an endangered species, this one was actually an introduced species. So this was actually the northernmost record of this species on the east coast of the United States. Um, and I like to share this example just because to me this really demonstrates one of the great reasons why we like to use apps like iNaturalist because without sharing this picture of the spider to iNaturalist, it could have taken years before anyone realized this spider was in the area. It's a small spider and Vermont, while it's not the biggest state, is still a very large area to search. Um, so it would have been really hard for someone to just find this spider um, on their own, but by using iNaturalist where you can share photos um, and people from all over the world can submit what they're seeing, it's way easier to discover new species, um, keep track of endangered species, and then also um, discover when a species like this arrives in an area and is considered introduced um, and could potentially someday cause a problem. Now, I'm not so sure that this spider would cause a problem, but it's it just goes to show that it's um, a good tool to use to maybe track other species that we may want to be more concerned about. So iNaturalist is an app that's considered a part of citizen science. Does anyone, um, has anyone heard of citizen, citizen science before or have a guess as to what it is? You guys feel free to type in the chat. Uh, Tobin says he's heard of it. Yeah, what do you guys think citizen science means? Well, what do you think it is? Olivia says a bit, they talk about it at VINs a lot. I bet they oh, do. Yeah. So again, <laughs> we know you've probably heard of it. What do you think it might mean? Citizen science. Anyone have a guess? Or even an example of a citizen science project that either so you've done Sophia, or you've heard of. Sophia says people who aren't really scientists officially going and exploring like scientists do. That's a good guess. Yeah. Uh, data collection, KL says. Yeah, that's Jacob that's says a database of organisms and plants that are recorded by people. Wow, yeah, that's good. And Olivia says recording species and things they see or hear. Lily says science for people who might just be an explorer and doesn't know much. Yeah, those are all great answers. I um, mean, you're mm -hmm. welcome to keep sharing your your answers. I'll I'll give you the official definition, but for the record, you guys were all really that's basically what you've described is what citizen science is. Um, it's considered the public involvement in the collection of scientific data. So it's people who may have a science background who are retired. They used to be um, work in science and they no longer do and they're still interested in helping out. Or it could be people who are just interested in science, who are explorers, who are amateur naturalists, who want to get involved and um, help out and ultimately help collect data for scientific projects. Um, and even though today we're talking a lot about how um, citizen science is used in the natural sciences, specifically um, with iNaturalist, um, you can, there are all sorts of citizen science projects out there, everything from microbiology to astronomy. Um, and there's different types of citizen science projects you can get involved in. You, you can work on ones where they're called crowdsourced, where it's, it's what iNaturalist is, where you basically have an app or a website or some other program that people just submit observations to without a whole lot of guidelines or a specific person they report to or anything like that. Um, they're more just projects you can go out on your own time and do pretty much however much you want, whatever time you want. And then there are um, site-specific citizen science projects, which I won't be talking about today, but if there's something that interests you, they're definitely out there. And these are projects where there's a bit more of a time commitment or a set of directions you might need to follow. You may have to show up at a specific time or go to a certain location. Um, and you may have a scientist you're specifically reporting to, someone who's going to train you to oversee the project. Um, I remember that one year I helped out with a project like that in Maryland where I was helping to collect mud crabs from the Chesapeake Bay to look for a parasite. And for that, there would be specific volunteer days um, that we'd show up to. 
and um, the specific ways we'd go about collecting this data. So I just share this with you just to give you a perspective that um, even though we're talking about a very specific citizen science program today that has a pretty broad reach all around the world, um, there's a lot of ways you can get involved in citizen science and I highly encourage you to um, explore different organizations that have opportunities for citizen science. So a little bit about me before we keep going. Um, my background, as I said, is in um, environmental science and policy. Um, I grew up in Vermont, so I'm pretty familiar with the land around here. I grew up hiking and swimming and just being outdoors all the time, and I fell in love with it. Um, and that's why I ended up wanting to do to study it for a career. I wanted to do something to help protect this area that I loved. Um, and I didn't get involved in iNaturalist until probably about a year, year and a half ago. Um, and I in initially got involved because I wanted to use it as a way to keep track of the things I was seeing um, in the world around me. For example, I went out to California the other summer and um, if anyone's been out to California, they might know that the plants and animals out there look very different um, in some cases than some of the ones here. It's a very different uh, climate. And so I, through using this app, I was able to slowly get to know the species out there and pretty soon could start identifying things. Um, and I'll talk a little bit in a minute about how iNaturalist does that. So what exactly is iNaturalist? So um, before I talk about what it is, do people want to guess as to what all those gray circles on the map are? Um, there are so many of them and at some points it actually just turns the whole continent gray. Does anyone have a guess as to what those circles mean? Uh, Sienna says sightings of animals. Um, we have species and observations, more sightings. Yeah, great. Yeah, so you're exactly, you're exactly right. Those are all individual observations of different species of plants, animals, fungi. I think even sometimes microscopic animals and plants end up on there. Um, yeah, so as you can see, this this iNaturalist program covers pretty much the whole world. There's very few spots on any land where there haven't been observations made. And this slide's actually a little out of date. This was from um, probably back in January. So it's so at this point, there's even more circles um, on here. Um, and there's even some out in the water. So there's people out in the ocean who are observing things. Um, and so this just goes to show how widespread this program is. And it's really interesting because it was actually a graduate student project. Um, so it was a group of students who started this. And then the, Nas and the National Geographic um, and some other organizations decided to help with funding and um, contributing other resources. So over the years, since 2008 when it was started, it's really grown and take off, taken off. So now it's, um, I believe at this point, there's over 1 million people using it and um, the observations that they're contributing help with science projects and um, policy initiatives and different conservation programs all around the world. Um, because pretty much anyone can go on this website and use this program um, to, to figure out more about what this, what's going on with the species that it's documenting. Um, because besides keeping track of invasive species, iNaturalist is really great just for um, monitoring how species distributions, where they're living in the world, is changing over time. And this is especially important as we think about climate change, because as the climate shifts in different areas and different parts of the world get warmer, chances are the species that want to live in colder areas are going to keep trying to move and keep up with um, their preferred temperature range. So iNaturalist is a really great way to keep, keep an eye on how climate change is affecting species by pushing them to move to new areas that they didn't live in before, um, ultimately helping to decide how to manage land um, to help keep those species safe. So it's pretty easy to use. That's one of the nice things about it. Um, it's available on all devices, uh, computers. Um, a lot of the things I'm going to show you first are a lot of um, computer computer based programs. You can do more on the computer, but you can also use it on your phone. You're both an Android and an, an, an iPhone. You can use it on a tablet, on an iPad. Um, and the other great thing about it is that it's free. Um, so you don't have to pay for anything at any point. You can just download it. The one thing is that it does require, if you're 13 years of age or younger, you do need a parent's permission. But when I work with classes and other 
um, other groups of students. Um, oftentimes the teacher or a parent or guardian will make an account and then work with the students as they collect their observations. So if you're 13 years of age or younger, don't be discouraged, you can still totally use this. You just may um, work with an older sibling or another adult in your life to um, upload the observations. So it's actually a great way to learn together as a team, which is pretty fun. And I like to think of it as a social media site for people who really love nature because ultimately what you're doing is you're taking pictures of things you see while you're out on your adventures. You're sharing those pictures with um, this site and then other people can comment on them. People can suggest identifications. That's a big part of this site is that other users will come along and either agree with what you've identified the species as or it will, uh, or they will say, oh, well, it might be this other thing. And you can get into discussions and learn a lot about um, how to identify different species in your area, which is really cool. Emily, Brenna says that she's already an iNaturalist user. Oh, awesome. Great. Well, you can tell me if I say anything wrong then. So real quick, I'm gonna get you guys thinking about how iNaturalist looks at photos because really what iNaturalist is doing um, is it's looking at photos that people submit to give people guesses about um, what species that, that they're submitting, which is um, probably one of my favorite functions of it because I can be out for a hike, I can take a picture of a plant and within about 30 seconds, it can give me a suggestion as to what it thinks it is. So do you guys wanna shout out in the chat what you guys think this plant is that's all over this mountainside? Olivia says wild blueberries. Brenna says blueberries. Tobin says a low bush blueberry. Ooh. Uh, wild blueberries from Jasmine. Jack def says definitely blueberries. See if anyone else. Uh, Ella also says blueberries. Ethan says blueberries. Sienna says blueberries. I'm catching a theme here because Lillian says blueberries and so does Lily. <laughs> wow, so no one thinks they're raspberries. I'm just kidding. You guys are all right, the blueberries. <laughs> and actually, yeah, you're right. Um, so yeah, these are blueberries. These are low bush blueberries. I believe that was one of the guesses. Um, and so do you guys want to share real quick, just in a word or two, what made you think that these were blueberries? It's, yeah. Uh, I was gonna says say leaf shape and berries. Uh, Eva says the blueberries. Others are saying they see the blueberries. Great. Erin is questioning that can you really see the blueberries? <laughs> Others have said leaf shape. I know with my eyes, I'm like, I don't know. Uh, Lily says the color of the bush. Uh, Sienna says size and leaf shape. Um, Lillian says I see the blue. Uh, Jack says he, they have a blueberry bush growing in my yard, so I'm guessing he just recognized it as oh, wow. something he's already seen. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, so those are all good things to recognize about the photo. And the reason why I asked you is because this is actually what iNaturalist does with every single picture that gets shared. Um, and not everyone it can identify by itself, but the ones that it can, basically it looks for features that look similar between um, photos of that same species. Um, so by using that existing knowledge that you guys already had about leaf shape and berry color, um, you guys were able to make a you guys were able to make a guess and your guess was right. And so this is kind of how the website works very similarly. Um, and so I'm gonna show you one more photo to guess about. So what species do you think is in this photo? Red tailed hawk says Brenna. Uh, Peregrine falcon is Ethan's guess and a bunch of other red tail hawks. Someone also said maybe a goshawk. Yeah. Uh, although K Kale's asking the tree or the bird. Ooh, okay. So that's, that's what I was wondering, but I didn't want to ask that. <laughs> Okay, awesome. So you guys got it. Two great things with this one. So first, even though there were a couple different answers to this, this is a red-tailed hawk, but even though there were a couple different answers, you guys all guessed that it was a raptor, a type of predatory bird, um, which is great because all raptors have very similar 
um, characteristics such as their beak shapes and their talons and usually their body shapes, although they might be different sizes and slightly longer or shorter wings and different colors. But you guys all guessed raptors, so that means that you know, you're able to recognize those features pretty clearly. Um, and I love the question about whether I was asking about the bird or the tree because that's actually the first time I've gotten this question. That's something I wanted to get at with this photo is that when you're uploading something to iNaturalist, it has no idea what, whether you're interested in the tree or the bird. So sometimes you might upload something and it's going to give you a bunch of really weird guesses and you're like, why, why is it suggesting that this insect is a maple tree? Well, it might be that it's on a maple tree and the computer can't figure out what you're asking about. Um, so it's just something to keep in mind um, as, and just to think about when you're taking photos and looking at things out in nature is um, how, how to frame what you're interested in. So not, not beyond the context of iNaturalist, just so it's clear to others what you're looking at as well. Um, and that's, yeah, that was a great question. Emily, so. Hannah in the chat wants to know if real scientists are identifying these pictures or other users of the app or some sort of automated system within the app. That's a great question. Um, and it's, you know, it's actually all three of those. So basically what's what happens, and I'll explain this in more detail as um, in a minute as I'm going through the process of how to upload stuff onto the app. But basically when you take a picture and you first go to put it on the website or in the app, it's going to give you a suggestion about what species it thinks you're trying to look at. Um, and you may look at that species and go, wow, that looks right. Or you may look at it and go, well, I don't really know and put down something else. Either way is fine. Um, once it's on the website or the app and you've shared it, other users can come on and either say like, yeah, you got it, that's great, or oh, it might be this other species. Sometimes people get in really interesting back and forth discussions about whether something is one thing or another thing. Um, and those people who are commenting, they can be um, experts who are you know, tenured professors at universities who study um, insects for a living, or they can be people who have spent a lot of time just studying insects in their personal life and don't have any kind of science background, but just know a lot about this subject because they've been really interested in it. Um, and the great thing about this is that you don't need to be a scientist to provide a lot of helpful information. Um, if you're looking at a photo and you know that it's an American robin, you can go and tell someone, hey, like you got an American robin, good job. Like you don't, you don't have to be an expert. You don't have to be identifying that one really tricky species that no one knows. It's just as helpful to provide information about common species as it is for things that are rare or might be interesting in some other way. So it's all sorts of people who are on here helping to provide identifications. Awesome, thanks. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, so you guys got these really well. This is a uh, low bush blueberry and a red tailed hawk. Um, so, there are a couple different ways you can use iNaturalist. And the first way that I like to use it is just for fun and to keep track of what I'm seeing. Um, so, for example, these, um, these pictures here are things that I've shared with iNaturalist a gray dogwood, a cedar waxwing feather, an American dagger, and a common buckthorn. And basically, using iNaturalist, once I've added these um, observations to the website, which I'll explain how to do in a couple minutes. Um, I can go back and look at them anytime I want. And so if I want to know um, where I saw, where I found that cedar waxwing feather in case I want to go back and see if the bird is there, um, I can actually look back in my observations and see on the map or by the location where I was exactly where I was, even if I happened to be 10 years ago. So if I'm returning to an area and I, there was a really cool plant I saw, say I was going back out to California and I wanted to find that white-headed woodpecker, I could go and look at where I was on the map and I can look at the date that I was there and use that to figure out um, when might be a good time to see that bird again. So it's kind of like a nature journal um, with photos in a lot of ways, which is really cool. Hey, Emily, um, Tobin asks, how accurate is the AI identification? And then Brenna just wanted to let you know that she added some observations of her own this morning. Oh, great. 
Um, so the, the AI is fairly accurate. Um, I would say for me, when I up upload things, it gets it right probably about, I would say about 80% of the time. Um, and when I'm sh when I'm demonstrating how to upload it, I'll go I'll show you an example of what it looks like when it guesses when it has a really good guess, and then what it looks like when it has no idea what it's trying to take a photo of or what it's trying to identify. Um, but I would I would say about eighty percent of the time it's accurate. So another way that you can use it, um, and this is what I was talking about a moment ago with people helping you identify something. So this is a moth that I saw in my garden one day and I didn't know what type of moth it was, but I knew that I naturally be able to help me figure it out. So I took this picture of this moth and I put it on the um, iNaturalist app using my phone. And so when I was asking it to help me figure out what species it was, which I'll show in a minute how you get to this place, um, but it says we're pretty sure it's in this genus. And then it gives me 10 different species that it could be. Um, and so this is, um, and the reason why it gives all these options is because it, even though it's really good at guessing what the species is in the photo based on um, certain features that it might notice, um, it's not, because it's not always right, it doesn't want to give me, yes, this is the definite answer. Um, but so it gives me the, these suggestions. And so I can kind of look through them and I'm like, all right, so the genus looks right. I look at the pictures of the moths that it suggests and compare them to the moth that I have saw and they all look right. Um, but for me, when I was looking through these species, I'm not a moth expert. Um, so I wasn't feeling really confident that I could say for sure which one it was. Um, and that happens a lot and that's okay. So I just left it at that genus, which is Hylus. Um, and pretty soon after I had uploaded this moth onto iNaturalist, I, um, you can see on the right side, I had other people coming in and suggesting what species it could be. Um, they were some person or initially suggested a white lined sphinx moth, um, and then someone else suggested a gallium sphinx moth. And then through looking at the photos, um, the three of us were kind of able to figure out that it was the gallium sphinx moth. Um, so on my own, I didn't feel confident enough to figure that out or make that decision. But with these other people who likely know more about moths than me, they were able to help me figure out what was going on. Um, and so that's why it's a great tool for learning more about how to identify things around you because even if it's not something that you personally know how to identify chances are there's someone out there on this website who knows how to do it so olivia asked and and, and brenna and jasmine are answering but i want to give you the opportunity to weigh in as well olivia wants to know does anyone ever upload tracks or bird calls oh yeah good question um yes so you can actually upload both um so tracks i um, tracks that you it'll often guess pretty well. Um, I've uploaded tracks of a moose before I believe and it was it gave me a moose or a deer as a suggestion so pretty accurate. Um, and you can also upload um, as you saw with the feather that I had you can upload feathers, hair, um, scat, different other animal signs. You can upload plant seeds. Um, so things that you might not normally think of as you know, being a clear picture of the animal or the plant, those kinds of signs can really help as well. Um, and bird calls, yes. So you can upload sounds to iNaturalist. The difference is though, is that um, there's no automatic features to help identify the sounds. Uh, other users will come on and listen to the sounds that you've uploaded. Like I've uploaded um, bird calls before um, and other users have told me what they are. So you won't be able to get an automatic suggestion as to what bird you're hearing, but usually within a few days, someone will say, oh, that's a um, uh, rose-breasted grosbeak was one of the ones I uploaded. Um, and for me, that's been really helpful because I personally am not super confident in bird calls. Um, so it's a great way to use the, the site, or you can um, record frogs in a pond nearby or, um, one of my coworkers recorded a bobcat screaming and put that on and someone was able to help identify it. So um, sounds are great to put on too, although I won't be talking about that as much today just because it's harder to demonstrate. Um, and another great way you can use iNaturalist is for class projects and learning more about a species. Um, so beyond just being a great website to go on and 
uh, share your photos, you can also go and learn more about the species that are on there. So for example, um, with this yellow trout lily, I searched on the website for a yellow trout lily and I got this information for it. So I got, um, it gave me a whole bunch of pictures of it, uh, most of which as long as you um, check which copyright license it has or free to use in class projects as long as you cite them. So if you're looking for great pictures of something for a project or report, you can go here. Um, it has these cool graphs that you can see on the right hand side. It has um, a graph um, for seasonality, for history, for whether it's male or female, for plant phenology. Um, and the plant phenology one's really cool because basically what those different lines on the graph are showing are showing the, um, the number of observations that were made of whether a plant was flowering or fruiting or budding. So if you wanted to know when the low bush blueberries that we were looking at earlier would be in season in a certain area when the fruit would be ripe, um, or at least on the plant, you could go to their, their, um, their page and look at that graph and say, oh, like uh, probably end of July, early August, they might be on the plant. Um, and so it's a cool way to learn more about the species that are being shown because beyond just what they look like or where they're found, you can learn more about um, how many of them are found in a certain area. Um, you can also learn about their taxonomy, so how they're related to, um, in the case of this trout lily, how it's re related to other flowering plants. Uh, you can find a species conservation status on this page. So even though yellow trout lilies are really common around here and I see them a lot in the springtime, by looking at the conservation status, I would know that if I went to Illinois, this is actually a rare plant, um, which could be good to know so I don't pick it or something if I find it. Um, and finally, you'll see a map on there as well. And this map will show all the observations that were made for this species. So in the case of the yellow trout lily in the map in the bottom left-hand corner, um, all those green circles, similar to the gray circles you guys um, we're looking at earlier, all these great, all these green circles are showing where this plant is found. So as you can see, it's mostly been documented in the eastern half of the United States, north of Florida. Um, and so this is just a great tool to go and learn more about the different species you're seeing um, and gain more information because oftentimes it'll also have links to other resources as well. So if you have a class project on a certain species and you're looking for more information, this can be a really useful tool. And finally, as far as um, how you can use it, one of the really um, great ways you can connect with other people is by joining projects. Um, and this is basically just a way to collect a bunch of observations on iNaturalist all at once. So for example, um, for Vermont Center for Eco Studies, we have two. We have the Vermont Atlas of Life and we have the Vermont Lady Beetle Atlas. And the Vermont Atlas of Life is basically just collecting any observation that was made of a wild plant or animal or fungi in Vermont and storing them all in one place so that then we can go and look at it um, and see what kind of species people are discovering in Vermont and use that data for um, better understanding Vermont's biodiversity. And for the Vermont Lady Beetle Atlas, it's, it's um, run similarly. It's still set in Vermont, but we're just collecting lady beetle species because we're trying to figure out um, where some of, whether some of the missing species that haven't been seen in the state in a couple of decades, whether they're still here or not. Um, and there are projects for pretty much everything. There are projects for tracks that'll just collect pictures of tracks that people have put on. Um, there's specific projects for wildflowers that'll just uh, collect observations of wildflowers. So it's just a really great way to um, not only have your observations all go in one place, but also just to get to know a community of naturalists who are interested in similar things to you. Um, I know through the Vermont Atlas of Life, we get a lot of people who are just enthusiastic about um, wildlife in Vermont and who really love to see what everyone else is finding. So I'm gonna explain how to um, add observations to the website, but before I do that, are there any questions that anyone has about the first part, what you can do with the site, how it works? And yes, feel free, you can raise your hand if you want or just or type your question into the chat box. Either one works. Lillian commented that she has, um, the flower you were talking about, Every she has those everywhere in the spring. Oh, great. They're one of my favorites. 
And Brenna says she had uploaded fox tracks. Ooh, to the cool. Site. Yeah. I don't see any questions or hands raised at this time, but again, you guys feel free if it's just a delay, we'll make sure your question gets asked. But Emily, I think you can uh, continue on. Great. Uh, yeah, if, Jacob's asking, where can I get it? Where can you get it? Great question. So if you're using it on your computer, all you have to do is go to inaturalist.org. Um, and if you're using it on a phone or a tablet, if you're using an Android based system, you'd go to the Google Play Store and search for iNaturalist and download it from there. Or if you're using your iPhone, you go to the Apple Store and download it from there. Um, and it'll probably prompt you to create an account. Um, but if you're older than 13, it's pretty straightforward. You just put in your user, your the username you want, your email address, um, your password. And if you're 13 years or younger, you'll probably need to create it with your parent or guardian or older sibling or teacher. And Erin's asking, will it automatically track location on a phone? She's assuming it won't on a computer. Yeah, I won't track a location on a computer because um, oftentimes when people are putting the pictures on uh, using their computer, they have a um, like a bigger um, handheld camera that they're using. Um, but for for um, your phone, it'll usually um, it'll usually have the location on automatically um, and if you're someone whose uh, location doesn't just automatically switch over to apps, you may need to go in and um, fix a setting. Um, but there are also ways through our naturalist to get it to stop recording your location. Um, you can obscure your, lo your location if you want more privacy as well. And Eva wants to know if you can have, um, can you have the same account on multiple devices? Yes, so if you create an account on your phone, it's also going to show up on your computer. You can log in from anywhere and it'll still have all your observations. And so you won't lose any information if you're switching between a computer and a phone. And that is what we have for the time being. Great. Yeah, so if anyone has any points or any questions at any point in this, feel free to shout them out and pause me, but um, for now I'm going to explain how you actually get started uploading observations. So to do this, I'm going to go side by side. I'm going to show you how to do it on a, on a computer, and I'm going to show you how to do it on an Android phone. That's what I have. Um, on an iPhone, it's going to work pretty similarly. Um, the buttons do look a little bit different, and I'll try my best to just describe what those would be. Um, but for those examples, I have this um, American mink that I found in Middlebury, Vermont. And then I have this pile of snakes that I found while hiking in the White Mountains. So I'm sorry if you don't like snakes. Um, so to start, um, you, you, if you're on your computer, there's usually a big green upload button in the top right corner of your screen. Or if you're on your home page, there's that um, blue add observation button. Um, and if you're on an Android phone, you can start adding, basically when you first open the app, it's gonna look like the screen that I have displayed. And in the bottom right corner, there's that green plus sign. Um, and that's what you're gonna click to start uploading an observation. And if you have an iPhone um, along the bottom, there's gonna be a gray camera that says observe, and that's what you're gonna click. Um, and throughout this, the buttons that I'm talking about or the areas that I'm talking about will be highlighted in red if you're wondering where I'm looking. Um, so when you click any of these buttons, it's going to give you options to either cho choose a photo or take one of your own. Um, and so when you're choosing a photo, it's just in your, um, your saved images or if it's on your computer, it's in your files. Um, and you can just go in and find that photo and select it or you can take a photo right from the app. Um, I personally will usually take the photo first if I'm using my phone through um, my phone's normal camera, and then I'll go back and find the photo to share it with iNaturalist. And I just do that because I find that um, my phone's camera works better outside of the app, just for me personally, but I know a lot of people who will open the app and take the picture there as well. Um, and finding, your, finding the photo works pretty similarly as it would for um, Instagram or other social media sites that you're using. So if you're familiar with any of those, you'll probably have a pretty easy time finding your photos as well. So once you have your photo, it's going to take you to a screen that looks a lot like this, where there's going to be different boxes, either with information or without information, and you can fill some of them in. You don't have to fill 
all of them in, but I'm going to talk about some of the most important ones. So the ones I usually check first are the date and location. Um, it's really important to make sure that these are correct and showing that they're um, showing the location and date from the day that you actually made the observation instead of the day that you're uploading them. Say you're, you took the photo on a Wednesday and you're uploading them on a Thursday. You just want to make sure that um, the date and location is for the Wednesday. Um, because that's where the it's going to show that the species was found. Um, and if if your date and location aren't showing, um, don't worry about that. There are ways to fix that. So for some reason on my phone, sometimes it won't automatically bring in the date and location. And if you're uploading on your computer, oftentimes the location won't come in for that either. Um, but in both cases, um, if you need the date, you just click in the box that says date, and it'll um, take you to a calendar. And you can just click on the day that you need. Um, and if you're looking for the location, if you click in the box that says um, that says location, it's going to take you to a map. And all you have to do is find your location on the map and zoom in. Um, and it's going to basically put a circle around where you were. Um, and once it does that, you just hit OK or you hit save um, and it'll take you uh, back to this page. It's pretty um, it's pretty intuitive once you see it. It basically looks like Google Maps if you're familiar with that. Um, but my favorite part, and the part that I'm going to show you here, um, is how you figure out what your species is. So for getting your identification, you either click in the species name box for your computer, or you click in the what did you see for your uh, smartphone. And when you click in either of those boxes, it'll take you to screens that look like this, where um, if you remember from the example of the moth earlier, it's giving me um, a broader category like family or genus, and then a bunch of species which are more specific. So for the American mink, or the, I should be saying, the brown mammal that I saw, uh, since we haven't identified it yet, uh, it's saying it's in the family for mustelids, and then it's giving me suggestions such as American mink, North American river otter, Eurasian otter, sea otter. Um, and so there's a couple things I can look at to try to figure out what species would be best. Um, does anyone have an idea of what I can look at on this page that might tell me what species um, would be a good fit with what I saw. There's a couple things here you can look at. Uh, Lily is saying scientific name and family. Mm -hmm. Tovin says body shape. Yeah. Uh, Olivia says pictures and the area they are said to be from. Lily says color. Eva says genus, visual details. Uh, Lily says marks. Yeah, these are, those are all great suggestions and those are all definitely things that I would look at. Um, probably the two key things I would look at here um, in this example is First, I would look at the photos and see, okay, does the species that's in the photo that's shown, does that look like the species that I took a picture of? And you can click on view, or if you're on your smartphone, you can click on those back and forth arrows that I put a red box around. And it'll actually take you to a page where you can compare your photo to a bunch of photos of the species that it's suggesting. So you can get a lot more um, photo evidence either to support it being that species or to say, well, it's probably not that species. It doesn't quite look like it. Um, so first, I would probably start by looking at the photos. Another great thing to look at on this page, what may, which may not seem obvious at first is a good thing to look at, um, is under the scientific name, it has the, that green writing that says either visually similar or seen nearby or both of them. Um, and so that's actually something I look at a lot because, um, for example, looking at the list for the mustelids, um, the top option is American mink, that's visually similar and seen nearby. Then North American river otter, that's visually similar and seen nearby. But then it's giving me, giving me Eurasian otter. Um, and the difference between that and the other two is that um, it's not carrying that label of seen nearby. So if I'm just looking through these species and I don't know a lot about them um, right away, I might look at that one and say, well, if it's not seen nearby, is it really likely to be that species? Um, and chances are it's probably not. So I'm gonna stick, I'm gonna narrow down my, um, 
my choices to just the ones that are both visually similar and seen nearby. And there are instances where this doesn't work. So for example, um, in the case of that spider at the very beginning, that probably wouldn't have been seen nearby, but that was, um, that's, it was there, even though it wasn't usually seen nearby. Um, but oftentimes that green writing can really help you narrow down your choices. Um, and so then I'd probably go back to looking at the photos and be like, okay, which photo does my does my observation look more like? Um, and if I was to look more closely at those photos, I would see the North American river otter looks a lot bigger. It's got a wider head. Um, it's got some white on it in different places than um, my observation did. And so from looking at the photos, I can tell pretty quickly that um, this was most likely a, an American mink. Emily, when you um, have a moment when you're talking, Ashton would like to know what was the most dangerous animal you've ever found hiking? I'm guessing your pile of snakes probably triggered that question. Oh, that's a good question. Um, hmm. I mean, so I'm going to go with the one that comes to mind right off the top of the bat and I don't know I'm trying to think if I was out west and I come came across anything because I would think anything I found out west was probably more dangerous than here but a couple months ago when I was hiking um, I found a moose in the middle of the trail that I was hiking on um, and that might surprise you is that being the most dangerous animal but you have to be really careful around moose they can be pretty aggressive um, they can get scared really easily um, so you actually have to be really careful around moose and the one I saw looked like a younger moose. It looked like it might have had um, some kind of health issue, like a lot of ticks on it or something. It looked pretty skinny. It wasn't really moving a whole lot. Um, so actually, I was able to go and hike around it, although it added like an extra 45 minutes to my hike trying to get around the moose because it kept walking up the trail as I would try to go around it. And um, But so that's probably the most dangerous animal I've encountered while out hiking, at yeah. least. For now, at least Brenna I hope said, it stays that way. Brenna says she was in Yellowstone last summer and was able to get a gray wolf on camera. And I'll say my husband and I were in Glacier National Park and thank God it was from a big long distance, but it was a family of grizzly bears. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, those are both really cool. I actually went to both those places um, a couple summers ago, and I was hoping to see a gray wolf or a grizzly bear from a safe distance. I didn't see either. So yeah, um, Glacier, for those of you who like wildlife encounters, I've been to a lot of national parks, and that was like, I mean, I could go on and on about what I saw and, and up close. And again, thank God the grizzlies were from, from afar. But related, Sienna wants to know, what is the weirdest or most unique animal you've seen or help identify? What's the coolest animal that you've logged? Ooh. Wow, that's a great question. Um, the coolest animal that I've seen. Well, let's see, as far as putting on iNaturalist, I feel like the coolest animal that I've helped observe. Um, trying to think because I know I've seen some and then as soon as as soon as it's like which one is it I'm like oh. Um, you can come back to it. I just yeah. I, I don't want to lose the questions because there's so much that goes on in the chat but if you want to give it a little bit of time we can come back to that. Totally, totally. How about um, ask me that question again at the end. I'm going to try to think about it because that's a really hard question. <laughs> okay, so Sienna, remember, towards the end, pop that in the chat again. But while everyone's uh, visiting the chat, how about you guys take a stab at what this pile of snakes could be based on kind of what I talked about in the other one. Um, out of the, basically the ones you can see there, it's giving me um, Western terrestrial garter snake and common garter snake. Um, which one do you guys think this pile of snakes was? I was in New Hampshire, just for the record. A bunch of people have, are chiming in saying common. Great, awesome. So that's right, it is a common garter snake. Um, and I'm sure a bunch of you are familiar with garter snakes. They're in the backyard a lot. Um, I see them a lot when I'm out gardening. Um, and I actually didn't know there were 
so many different types of garter snakes really until I posted this photo, but a lot of what we see around here are common garter snakes. Um, and you can tell this by looking at, once again at that visually similar and seeing nearby. Because actually when I had looked at this fo these photos when I was uploading this observation, the Western terrestrial garter snake actually looks pretty similar to the common garter snake. So it was really that, um, that divide of not being seen around here that really helped me make the decision. Otherwise, I may not have been able to decide so clearly. So these are both examples of when iNaturalist is giving great suggestions and working as it should, but sometimes you may upload something and it'll give you this kind of uh, list where it's giving, it's giving me a white-headed woodpecker, which is actually what it is, but it's also giving me a striped skunk, a Virginia opossum, an American black bear, and actually the option below American black bear was giant panda, um, which I was in California uh, in the mountains and there really aren't any giant pandas around there unless one escaped, so it was a little little confused. Um, and as you can see at the top, it's saying we're not confident enough to make a recommendation. So chances are my photo of this uh, woodpecker, it wasn't great. It was pretty blurry. Um, I took it from pretty far away. I was trying to snap the photo real fast before it flew away. Um, so I don't really blame it for not being able to tell what this is right away. I mean, really, it almost looks like it could be blending in with the uh, tree behind it. But so sometimes you may take a photo and this will happen. It might not even give you white-headed woodpecker. It'll just give you a laundry list of 10 different species it could possibly be, just throwing a bunch of stuff at the wall and seeing what'll stick. Um, and so if this happens, don't worry. Um, a couple things you can do. First, if you know the species that's in your photo, say you took a photo of an American robin and for some reason it's telling you that you tried to upload a picture of a lady beetle, um, you can just type in American Robin and, it, and select it. Um, so you have some power to choose. However, let's say you're looking at this photo of the white-headed woodpecker and white-headed woodpecker isn't a suggestion and you don't know what species of bird it is, but you know you're looking at a bird. It's totally fine to write in bird and just leave it at that because once again, other people are gonna be coming along. They're going to be offering suggestions. Um, they're probably gonna know more about bird species than I am, especially if it's from a different state. And so chances are they're gonna be able to give me a much better recommendation as to what it is. Um, and so that's a really great way that this um, kind of crowdsourcing different identifications can help because if you just put down bird, that's totally fine. Other people will help. Um, if for some reason you're looking at this photo and you just saw a glimpse of it real fast, you weren't even sure it was a bird for some reason, um, it's totally okay even just to put animal. Or more commonly, if you're looking at a plant species and you're like, oh, I don't even know, is this a fern? Is this a small tree? What is this? It's okay just to put plant as well. Um, there's a lot of people on there who are going to have knowledge in those specific areas. And if you just put animal or plant, they're gonna be able to find those observations and they're gonna be able to help out. If you leave the box blank, it automatically goes to unknown. And that ends up in this weird gray area of iNaturalist with like pictures of people's feet and um, random pictures of rocks and just really blurry photos where, you know, someone could find your photo, but they're gonna to have to sift through a bunch of photos that probably can't be used on iNaturalist. Um, and just to find yours. So by labeling it an animal or a plant or a fungi, people are going to find it a lot faster because they're going to be looking through those categories already. So when in doubt, it's totally fine just to leave it as broad as you need to. So once you have your, your name of your animal, the location, the date, um, there's a couple more things you can fill out if you want to. Um, these aren't things that I deal with as much, but um, you can add to description or notes. So if you saw your the species doing something really interesting, say I saw that mink catch and eat some prey right before I took the photo, I could write down what the prey was. Um, or if you're looking at a species that um, has some pretty distinct identifying features, but they don't really show up in the photo, like um, if the mink had a big white spot on its other side and I just couldn't get a photo of that other side, or especially in the case of insects um, where it can be hard to get a clear photo of them, um, you can write a verbal description there as well. You can describe what you're seeing, um, which can also help people understand, like, um, could also help people uh, make an identification as well. I'll see that a lot, especially, I say again, especially for insects, just because there can be really tiny features that are hard to photograph that'll help people figure out what's going on. Um, so if there's any additional information you feel like people need to know, then that's where it goes. Um, 
in that section where it says location is public or location visibility is open, that's where you can change your, um, your privacy settings. So you can leave it as public or open, but you can also change it to obscured, which basically draws a big rectangle around where you were and puts a random dot in it. So people know about where you were, but they're not gonna be able to tell exactly where you were standing. Um, or you can set it to completely private so no one knows where you are at all. Um, Ellen Watt is wondering, what does captive or cultivated mean? Great question. So captive or cultivated is basically talking about um, a domesticated plant or animal. So for example, if I had taken a picture of that mink and it was in a zoo, I would want to mark captive or cultivated. And basically what this does is it just treats the observation differently because oftentimes scientists are using this um, this website and this app for um, learning more information about a wild species. But if you're taking a picture of a species that is domesticated or in a zoo or on a farm or something um, that might not be there naturally and it was put there by people, uh, it can make the data a little bit confusing if there's a bunch of species in there that um, it shouldn't be that we're put there by people. So another great example is if you're taking a picture of the tomatoes in your garden, you'd want to mark this box um, because they weren't just growing wild, they were planted there. Um, same with if you're um, out in your town and you see a bunch of flower bushes, chances are those were planted by people. And it's okay to put pictures of them up here um, if you want to know what they are, but you just mark them captive versus cultivated, captive and cultivated so that people don't um, treat them as if they were wild species. Um, so those are kind of the really important things to to mark down. There are some other boxes, but I'm not going to talk about them today just because I personally don't use them that often. Um, and you can create great observations without using them, so I want to keep it pretty simple. So I have another question for all of you because we're gonna talk about what you should and shouldn't put on iNaturalist. And I've talked about that a little tiny bit, uh, but I wanna see what you suggest of things that you should put on iNaturalist. What do you think you should be putting pictures of on there? Uh, animals and plants, nature not rocks, organisms, animals and plants and fungi. Oh my God, now it's all coming in. Nature, animals, plants, things that are outside, tracks, calls, uh, something you've never seen, animals and plants, life. Yeah. New <laughs> okay, we're not gonna get you guys for, for spelling. <laughs> so I know you meant nature, but it says nurture. Um, or maybe you meant nurture. I'm not. Uh, things others may be unsure of. Insects. Yeah. So these are, these are all great suggestions and all, um, for the most part, totally things you should be putting on iNaturalist. Um, so just to refine it a little bit, Ultimately, we want to be putting um, pictures of wild plants and animals on there. Once again, you can put captive or cultivated on there, but um, I generally try to discourage that. But you can put on common species, rare species, um, animal sign like we talked about before. So feathers, fur, scat, and tracks, um, and plant seeds and flowers as well. And so usually when I say common species and rare species, people have a couple different reactions to this. So first, common species. Why would I put on an American robin? I see them. 20 times a day. There's one in my yard right now. I see it every day. They're all over the place. Um, everyone's seeing them. Why should it be on there? Um, and so the reason why you want to put super common species on there is because just because they're super common today doesn't mean that they're always going to be super common. Um, and so one example I give is there used to be a species of bumblebee in Vermont called the rusty patched bumblebee and it was pretty common. I think it was one of our most common species and it hasn't been seen in a couple decades. Um, and so although we wouldn't want to think of our robins and our chickadees um, and our yellow trout lilies as being things that eventually we're not going to see anymore, um, that's always a risk with nature. So by taking pictures and putting common things up on the website, um, if they do start to disappear or um, there are any other questions about how they're doing, it helps to have that database already there. Um, so so common species are important to photograph just to keep track of how they're doing over time. 
Um, and for rare species, the concern is usually that if you post a picture of a rare species, someone is gonna go and capture it or pick it. Um, and that's a valid concern. There are people out there, unfortunately, who would do those kinds of things. But the good thing about iNaturalist is if you're putting something on there that is considered rare in iNaturalist, um, so it's listed as threatened or endangered by the state or by a country, um, it's gonna automatically obscure the location. So only um, scientists who have access to that kind of information will be able to tell exactly where it was. Most people will just be able to see, um, like it was in the Northeast corner of Vermont and that's all they know. Uh, Lily's asking, what is this rare species that's photographed? And then just below it, what is that seed? Ooh, so the seed is a, I believe it's a hickory. Um, and the plant, I can't remember exactly what the plant is, honestly, because it was a species that I had actually never heard of before. Um, and I had it in my notes, and unfortunately I'm using a different version of the presentation, and I guess it's not in these notes. Um, I think, I know it had, I, I believe it had some kind of weed in the name though, like, um, oh, yeah, unfortunately I don't remember the specific species of plant. Um, but I remember, I remember it was one that I hadn't heard of before. I think there's really only like one or two records. Brenna of it is saying it looks like bloodroot. Yeah, it does look like bloodroot. And that was actually my first thought, but I can't remember if bloodroot is considered rare or not in Vermont. Um, Aaron is asking, what should we do if we see an organism, specifically a plant that is technically wild, but came from a cultiv cultivated plant? Ooh, that's a great question. Um, and I believe in that case, you wouldn't mark the box um, because I think it's, you only have to mark the box if it's something that was directly put there by people because I know there's been questions, um, especially like among my coworkers about whether feral cats and dogs would be considered wild on iNaturalist, whether or not you check the box. And I believe according to iNaturalist rules, you don't check the box for those because even though they are technically a species that's domesticated, they aren't being put there or controlled by people anymore. They just live there. Um, so I would say that if you come across a plant that is a cultivated species, but it's just growing wild, I know sometimes um, different like uh, tomatillos and different species of tomatoes will kind of just grow in the woods or different species of grapes. Um, I believe you can just uh, leave the box unmarked. Will the site tell you if the species is invasive? Yes, it will. So if you have found an invasive species, when, um, when your observation, when your identification um, gets on there, and I can't remember if it's when it's confirmed by other people or just when you add the, add the name to it, there's, a, there's an I that will be encircled in like magenta um, and it'll show up right next to the name. Nice. So it'll be, yeah. And I want to say Brenna is doing a great job answering a lot of these questions in the chat. And Brenna, just so you know, I'm reading them out loud because we're recording and I think these questions are really good to just get out and have it said because our people watching at a later date won't be able to see all the great responses you are putting into the chat box. So thank you for, for uh, being Emily's co-pilot today. <laughs> yeah, that's great. I really appreciate it. It's really helpful having someone answer the questions. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so these are uh, things that you should be putting on iNaturalist. Do you guys have guesses for things that you shouldn't be putting on iNaturalist? So while you guys are typing in, Tovin had downloaded the app just now and he's been testing out the, the AI capabilities. And he said it just identified the rare plant as a broadleaf water leaf. Oh, that sounds right. Yeah. I think that's why I was thinking bloodroot, because at first I, I was thinking that, that uh, letter B. So I, I, that sounds right to me. And putting in what you shouldn't put in um, iNaturalist, we have Pokemon, lost pets, grass, humans, uh, building, uh, general objects, another Pokemon, <laughs> a chair, finished wood, dirt. You guys are all funny. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, those are, for the most part, those are all great suggestions. I would say, um, 
food. Yep. Um, I would say uh, the one thing that was listed that should probably go on a naturalist um, is grass. I, I mean, maybe not lawn grass. I think it's okay. I think it's safe to say lawn grass shouldn't go on there, but there are a bunch of species of wild grasses that can definitely go on there. Although a lot of you would probably look at them and not necessarily know that they're grasses because they look they often have flowers and they look a lot prettier than the species of grass that often makes up our lawns. Um, but those are a lot of really good suggestions. So here's what I have. Um, so domestic, once again, domestic or captive animals, cultivated plants. So like the lost pets, you wouldn't want to put people's lost pets on there. Um, fossils and rocks you don't want to put on there. Um, so even though fossils are technically things that were living at one point, um, iNaturalist is really interested in things that were recently living, so within the last few decades um, or 100 years, but maybe not things that are like a couple thousand years old or, or older. Um, people, there are plenty of social media sites out there that can handle people being on them, um, but having photos of people up on a website can, raises a lot of concerns about privacy, so you don't want to put pictures of people up on iNaturalist. Um, and finally, non-living things, even though you could argue that lawn flamingos are kind of an animal, um, I don't think scientists are really that interested in where the flocks of them are at the moment. So for now, we're going to leave all non-living things off of iNaturalist. But so, so Br Br Brenna is saying that you can put bones on. Bones, yeah. So you can. So that's yeah. And so that's that's the difference. So you can put bones on. Um, but bones of something that's like a recent species. So say if you come across like a place where a coyote has killed um, a rabbit or something like that, you can put those bones on. Um, however, you wouldn't, say you happen to be hiking deep in the mountains and you found one of those saber tooth, or I guess that's a cave bear, one of those cave bear skulls. Not that you'd probably find one around here, but if you happen to, you wouldn't want to put that on just because that's, that's a species that's been gone for so long that um, scientists aren't really trying to keep a record of its distribution or whether or not its populations might be uh, still existing somewhere in the world. Um, so only things that have died fairly recently. But yeah, bones are another good thing to put on if you happen to find like a deer skeleton or something like that, for sure. So the last little bit I have is just talking about where data goes. Because um, as I've mentioned, um, all this data is being used by scientists and policymakers and conservationists all over the world. Um, and how it does this is basically, so I've talked about how other people come on and they add identifications. So if there are at least two people agreeing with your identification, um, it enters this, this category called research grade. And basically what it means is it's then taken from iNaturalist and it's put on um, this website in the state in this database called the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. And from there, um, people from all over the world can access um, the observations and the data that's collected. And um, not just iNaturalist feeds into this website. Um, I, I know um, if you're familiar with eBird, if you love birds, um, that's another citizen science app that also ends up with data on this site. Um, I know researchers will put data on this site from their projects. So basically this is just a giant library of where people can, who are interested in studying a certain species or are making decisions about a certain area can come and find all this information about um, what species are present there, when they were seen, um, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so it's a really neat site, um, and I know that um, people I work with use it a lot for um, different biodiversity projects in Vermont. And so in Vermont specifically, um, any observation that's made here, as I mentioned earlier, ends up in the Vermont Atlas of Life, which is a project that's run by the place where I work, which is the Vermont Center for Eco Studies. And so basically this information is being used to map and monitor Vermont's biodiversity so that people can make better conservation decisions about the state and so we can get a better understanding of what lives here, how different species are doing, um, and how they may respond to climate change or um, different land use changes in the future. So with that, I'd like to open it up to additional questions. Uh-oh, you're muted, Lauren. Muted. Oh, you're muted. Email, um, when I send out the at-home activities today, so don't worry about frantically writing that down if you don't want to. 
Um, we do have a question from Sienna. Um, this is the question she asked you earlier, is what's the most unique or rare animal you have logged or helped identify, and what's the coolest thing that you've logged? Okay, so I think the thing, the rarest thing that I've helped identify, I think for me, the first thing that jumps to mind, um, and it may not be something that you guys think is super cool, but um, it's a species of lady beetle that hadn't been seen in Vermont in 40 years. And just within the last couple months, one of my coworkers was out doing a lady beetle survey and it actually just landed on his net. Um, and so he emailed all of us and was like, I think I found one of these and put it on iNaturalist. And sure enough, it's um, called a four spotted spur leg lady beetle. Um, and yeah, it hadn't been seen in Vermont since the 1970s. And because I've been helping study lady beetles a little bit at um, BCE, I was able to help identify it. Um, as far as the coolest thing that I've personally found, I'm trying to look back through my iNaturalist actually, because sometimes when you, when you're put on, uh, when you're trying to think of <laughs> everything that you've seen, it gets a little hard to, uh, remember off the top of your head. But I would say one of the coolest things I actually came across, um, and this is a set of observations, um, and this was once again recently, um, was I saw, I was out for a hike and I came across a porcupine. Um, and this was a living porcupine and it was running around through the woods and kind of scuttled away. And then I was hiking up the trail and about a hundred feet up the trail, I actually found a dead porcupine, um, which was pretty crazy to see that live porcupine and then come across a dead one a few minutes later. It was a little spooky. Um, and then I walked up the trail further and I found a porcupine den. Um, which was so it was kind of a, it was interesting to see that oh this is an area where porcupines are pretty pretty active um, and the dead porcupine ended up being pretty cool because I put it on iNaturalist um, and I had suspected that a fisher might have killed it and then other people chimed in and said yeah fisher definitely killed it so it was kind of cool being able to not only recognize that the porcupine lived in the area but then also see that web of okay then this species lives in the area because of um, finding this dead porcupine and getting to through that one observation getting a better picture of what's going on in the forest so that was pretty cool for me. Um, Lily is asking if the if these sites are in the extra activities and and I did not look but you did put the iNaturalist link right in there right? Yep. Yeah. yeah so you guys will have that and if you still have yesterday's email that I sent with the at-home activities, in the actual body of the email, I put the information about going to download the app or just going to inaturalist.org. So it's also there, but you'll definitely have it in the at-home activities. Um, Jack wants to know if you can put, my, uh, put a microorganism in the iNaturalist. Yeah, totally. Um, I see people put uh, pictures of microscopic algae on there all the time, like uh, cyanobacteria and um all yeah all sorts of especially people who are lake monitors putting stuff that they find in the water by looking under a microscope on there nice um if you're 13 or under do you have to get adult supervision to add a single every photo so do you do you get the permission once or does that adult supervision have to be every single time i believe the adult the adult permission is to make the account Okay. Yeah, that um, makes sense. Yeah. So once you have the account, you're good to go. Yeah. And yeah. there's also another app as well um, called Seek, which is related, which is iNaturalist, except you just can't, um, you can't share the photos, but you can still go and identify things as well. Um, and I can't remember if I included that in the resources, but that's open for anyone of any age to use as well. Um, and that can link to an iNaturalist account. So ultimately your stuff can end up there as well. Nice. Um, Aaron wants to know if it's possible to browse by location, like browse in Asia, even though you're, you're, you live in Vermont. Yeah, absolutely. So there is a page on iNaturalist called Explore, um, and you can go there and explore any region of the world, any species, any group of species. Um, you basically remember that big map that I showed you a little while ago that had all the gray circles on it, like the very thing, first thing I showed you about iNaturalist, that's basically the explore page. So you go there and you can zoom in on any part of the map. You can, there's a search bar, you can search for location, um, you can search for species. Um, so it's really cool just to go and explore and see what other people are finding in other parts of the world. So you can definitely go and search for that. Nice. 
So, um, Ellen, I'm going to have you unshare your screen. And okay. what, if you guys have additional questions, that's fine. Um, but what we're going to do right now, I'm going to go share my screen with you. We're going to do our wrap up feedback. Um, as you guys know, we always like to make sure we have feedback for our presenters. So launching the poll on a scale of one to five, rate the knowledge you gained um, from Emily today. And be thinking about one thing you learned, because we're going to do that next. So as always, if you don't see the poll, um, just write in the chat box. Um, you also can continue to add questions. Just um, hold off on your questions until I can get back into the chat. So I'm going to keep the, the uh, poll open for about five more seconds. Just get your responses in. All right, I'm going to end the poll. So let me uh, remind you guys so what we're going to do right now i really like the chat blast that we did yesterday so i want you to think about at least one thing you learned today don't hit send but get it queued up and ready in the chat box and then we're going to blast it out and this will be a great way um, to give emily feedback to make sure so Emily, one of the things we're gonna want you to do is, Emily's an Eco AmeriCorps member, right? You're still one? So a lot of, um, she has, so she does outreach as part of that. And I know she needs to document all the different outreach activities that she does. And so one of the great things is she'll be able to tell, you know, what, what you all learned from her. So let's write in the chat blast at least one thing you learned. I'm gonna give about 10 more seconds. And when I do the three, two, one countdown, we're all gonna hit send at the same time. And then we'll have this really nice record of everything you learned from Emily and she can use that to share back as part of her Eco AmeriCorps program. So three, two, one. Oh, coming fast and furious. So it looks like a lot of people were excited just to learn what iNaturalist was and how to use it. How many of you put in the chat box? How many of you are gonna start using this now and, and spend some time this summer going out and, and putting that? Yep, we got a lot. Awesome, that's great. You know, one of the nice things about learning about iNaturalist is now you have this tool. So when you're out in, in the woods and out on your hikes and walks, you have this great, um, tool to use to start identifying and begin learning about flora and fauna and, and uh, expand your knowledge base. So I'm going to be sharing the at-home activities with you for any of you that want to take a deeper dive. Um, I know the Vermont Center uh, for Eco Studies is a really great resource, so I would definitely check that out. Emily, if you could unmute yourself, I'm going to stop sharing for a moment. I would love for you to tell everybody briefly just what Eco AmeriCorps is, because um, a lot of these guys are teens, and this might be something that, that they want to know about for, for you know college, post college. Yeah, definitely. So Eco AmeriCorps is a um, it's a government funded program, and basically there's. Um, there's AmeriCorps all over the country. If you've heard of Peace Corps, where you go to a different country and you do volunteer work, whether it's helping to um, improve a community or build a certain project or something like that, um, it works similarly, except um, AmeriCorps is based in the United States. So um, for Eco AmeriCorps, what we do is we um, each member gets partnered with a different organization and we serve for 11 months. And during that time, we help complete projects for that organization. Um, so I have um, co uh, peers and friends who are serving at organizations where they're restoring stream banks or um, doing sailing education for younger children, um, people who are helping out with land trusts, monitoring trails, um, trying to think. Uh, so Vermont Center for Eco Studies, there's actually two AmeriCorps members. There's myself and I do a lot of um, workshops and helping uh, with raising awareness for a lot of our programs. And then there's another member who 
um, visits landowners to collect information about uh, grassland birds that might be nesting on their property. Um, and he also helps manage volunteers who uh, monitor vernal pools. Uh, so basically, EcoAmericorps is a really great way to um, learn more about what it's like to work in the environmental field and in different um, in different positions. There's a lot of different um, educational opportunities where we have um, speakers come in and talk to us about different environmental careers. Um, we have workshops where we get to learn new skills that'll help us um, as professionals. So it's a great way to just kind of get your feet wet in the environmental field and figure out if it's something that interests you in doing full time for a career. Great, thank you. So you guys, let's all thank Emily for her time today. Uh, tomorrow we have our final session. Um, and I'm glad you actually mentioned that Eco AmeriCorps is the US version of, of kind of like the Peace Corps, because tomorrow we have someone who actually did serve in the Peace Corps doing international environmental work. So that should be really interesting to learn and be thinking about ways you can do stuff on an international level. Um, so we look forward to seeing you all tomorrow. Thank you, Emily, so much for giving us your time today. Um, and so you all get, get on it, download your iNaturalist and get outside and start exploring. And we'll see you tomorrow.